Hey, Cross of Life, another Lent devotion as we're working through the book of Luke. Today we're on chapter 10, verses 1 to 42. Uh, we kind of have three, three accounts here, and so I'll give you a paraphrase of them and then three devotional thoughts. Uh, the text starts with Jesus appointing 72 who are going to go out, kind of in the same way that Jesus appointed um, his disciples to go out earlier in the text. And he tells them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And what's interesting about this is the very next word he says is, go, I am sending you. <laughs> so it's like, it's this sense of like praying for God to do his work in the world. And then Jesus immediately saying, yeah, you're the one who's going to do it, right? And well, that'll be one of our devotional points, but I just want you to notice that right away. Um, he gives them a whole bunch of instructions about um, not taking a purse or bag or sandals or greeting anyone on the road and saying peace to this house, stay there eating, don't move from house to house. Um, and when you are enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you, heal the sick, proclaim to them that God, the kingdom of God has come. But if you're not welcome, wipe the dust off your feet and the kingdom of God will continue to come. And then he has these woes um, about the towns that are going to reject him. And particularly he names Chorazin and Bethsaida um, and it says, you know, if, if you are, if you had um, the miracles performed in you that were performed in Tyre and Sidon, you would have repented, but you didn't. And it's going to be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than you. Tyre and Sidon are notoriously anti, um, anti-Christian cities in the scriptures. He also names Capernaum and says, no, that Capernaum will go down to Hades. Um, now he says, whatever, now he, he makes this statement and sort of summarizes what he's saying. He says, whoever listens to you, listens to me. And whoever rejects you, rejects me. Whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me. And this is huge because we have to remember that as we preach the words of God, that we are going to receive the exact same reactions that Jesus received, that the majority of people are going to reject him. I mean, think about this. Jesus had some huge crowds following him, but that wasn't even close to the majority of the human beings who lived in the area at the time. Um, everybody knew about him, but not everybody knew him. And I think we have to understand that that's the same for us. Like we're going to speak what Jesus speaks and we're going to be rejected for the most part. Um, but there are going to be those who hear those words and they believe. And that's why we ought to keep speaking. The 72 return and they say, Lord, even the demons submit to us in our, in your name. And Jesus replies, I saw Satan fall like, have, like lightning from heaven. Um, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, and here's the important thing he says, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. In other words, he changes the focus and um, helps them understand that there are things far more important than success in this world. This is going to be another one of our devotional points today. At that time, Jesus uh, says, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. In other words, he says, look, the, the gospel is not going to be understand because you are particularly intellectually um, gifted or successful. It's going to be because the Holy Spirit is the one who works faith in the heart of a believer. And we have to be, we have to be honest about that. We are not saved because we are particularly good people, but because the Holy Spirit is a particularly good God. And he continues to give faith and strengthen faith in our hearts. Um, Jesus continues, all things have been committed to me by a father. No one knows uh, who the son is except the father. And so the idea here is that there is this inter uh, penetration of the Trinity that's going on where the father and the son and the Holy Spirit are all active and God using the uh, God, the Holy Spirit brings people to Jesus who, which brings them to the father who saves them, right? And it brings them into that inner life of the Trinity and eternal life. And then he turns to the disciples. He says, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but they did not see it. In other words, he says, all those Old Testament believers, they, they wished they could see me come. And now you get to see it. And so don't lose this moment. Remember this. This is important. He then tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, which is a, uh, a very um, well-known parable. A man comes to him and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus asks, well, what's written in the law? And um, the, the guy answers correctly, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, yeah, you got it. That's what you do. Um, but the man wants to justify himself. And the point is he, he realizes what the law is and he realizes he's not living up to it. And so he wants to find a loophole. He says, okay, well, if neighbor means everybody, then I'm not doing it. So I must narrow down the category of neighbor to a specific group of people that I actually can help. And so he asks, who is my neighbor? 
And Jesus tells them the story about a man who was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. He's attacked. He's stripped of all of his things. He's left on the side of the road half dead. And a uh, priest walks past and does not help him. A Levite walks past and doesn't help him. But then a Samaritan who would have been, um, there would have been a, a serious level of racial segregation between the Jews and the Samaritans. Um, they didn't interact with each other. They didn't like each other. But a Samaritan comes and he, he finds the man, takes pity on him, um, t- pours oil and wine in his wounds, takes him to an inn, pays for his time at the inn. And... Um, and then Jesus says about this Samaritan, uh, which, which of the men do you think is the, the one who was a neighbor? <laughs> and the expert who had, in the law who had asked Jesus his question about who is my neighbor said, well, the one who has mercy on him. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. And there's so many layers to this. And I'll just give them to you really quickly because I don't want to necessarily make a devotional point of them. But um, first of all, we have to understand that this is not about being a good person. This is about realizing that we are the ones who have been beaten up and, and taken by sin. And that Jesus, like the good Samaritan comes and saves us and pays the price for us. This is not about how we behave. This is about Jesus. And it's obvious because of the fact that he calls him a Samaritan. Jesus is not like us, right? In the same way that a Samaritan is not like a Jew. And there is a wall of hostility between the Jews and the Samaritans, just like there was a wall of hostility between you and Jesus. And yet Jesus chooses to go past that breakage in your relationship to be kind and generous and compassionate and forgiving to you. So that's the big point of this. But we also have to understand um, that this parable does teach us actually how to love our neighbor and that it still is a law that we cannot keep. in a sense, Jesus does narrow down neighbor, which is what the man wanted him to do. But the thing is, Jesus narrows it down and then shows him that he actually can't do it. <laughs> um, he narrows down neighbor to the person who's right in front of you, right? Like he, his whole story is about like, there was literally a guy on the ground who was dying and no one would help him even though they were right in front of him until a Samaritan did it. And so like, like Jesus is saying to this guy, like, I, all I want you to do is just love the person who's right in front of you right now. And every one of us knows we can't do that, right? Like that is a law that is crushing. Like if we think we can pull it off, we will fail. We need the gospel. And what Jesus is doing is trying to show us our need for the gospel. He's showing us like, yeah, probably you should love every single person in the entire world and you should be sacrificial and and generous with them. But all I'm asking you to do is just do that for one person, literally the one person who's in front of you. Is it your spouse? Is it your child? Is it the people that you're working with right at this moment? Like whoever is in front of you, can you love them? And all of us have to admit, no, I can't. I am selfish. I am not focused on them. I'm not thinking about them or their needs. I'm thinking about my needs and I'm thinking about how I honestly can use them, other people in my life to get my needs met. Um, So the law, of course, is driving us um, deeper down into despair of ourselves so that we can hear the gospel and be saved. Okay, I realize that was kind of a devotional point, but it was a bonus, bonus devotional point. You don't have to pay extra for this one. Last part of this text is Mary and Martha. And Jesus comes to Mary and Martha's house. And maybe you know this story. Uh, Martha is working in in the house and she gets irritated because Mary is not working in the house. She's just sitting at Jesus' feet listening. So Martha comes to Jesus and says, um, seriously, Jesus, like, don't you notice that my sister is not helping me? (laughs) Tell her to help me. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better. And that is namely the word of God. She wanted to hear Jesus um, and it will not be taken away from her. Okay. A couple devotional points here. Uh, (coughs) Excuse me. Um, The, the idea of uh, how Jesus says to the, the disciples, Like I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven and I'm giving you the ability to drive out demons, but you should think higher of the, the, the fact that the spirits, or excuse me, that your names are written in heaven rather than the spirits submitting to you. Um, I don't think many of us, if any of us, if you do tell me, (laughs) um, are driving out demons regularly. And so like, I think we can think, oh, this doesn't apply to us. Um, but how many things like successes in the world do we, do we build ourselves up about like, yeah, personal accomplishments, growth of wealth, you know, good parenting, whatever those things might be. But even as we look at the world at, at large, you know, success in the political arena, success in the economic arena, um, we, 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 we so quickly rejoice over those things. We so quickly put our hope in those things. We so pr- quickly put our comfort and our peace and our security and our future in those things. And Jesus says, those things are nothing compared to the fact that your names are written in heaven. And I think we all, all ought to meditate on that. Like, so I'm thinking about my day today and I'm thinking about making more of these videos 
I'm thinking about writing a sermon. Uh, I've got a trip this week that I gotta, I gotta make sure that I, I use my time wisely. I don't want to take care of my family. And I, I have the sense that if I would just do all these things right, if I would just manage my time right, I would, I would be happy and they would be happy and everyone would be happy. But Jesus is happy. Jesus is happy with me. Whether I make this video or not, whether I use my time wisely on my trip or not, whether I'm a good father or not, he's happy with me. And that actually will allow me to do those things well. To not see making these videos as an, ob as an obligation or the work that I'm going to do as a chore or my family's happiness as something just to pacify, but something that I can, I can do extra for because I know that I don't have to do it. <laughs> my name's written in heaven. It's such a powerful, uh, powerful thought. And if you're willing to like run everything that's going on in your day um, through this idea that it's, it's so important, uh, through this idea that, that Jesus has, has made something far more important, real and true and unbreakable in your life, like everything else fades to the background. I want that for you. So whatever you're thinking about today, drive it through that idea. Um, second devotional thought, I want to go back to the beginning of the text where Jesus says, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send workers into his harvest field. And then he says, go. <laughs> and I commented on this, I think. Um, it's so powerful that Jesus tells us to pray for workers. And then he tells the workers to go and do the work. Um, I think we have this sense in North America, because so much of our life is like this, where like, we essentially get everybody, get somebody to do everything for us, right? There's very little that we actually do for ourselves. Um, you know, our food, yeah, we go to the grocery store and buy it, but we don't package it or grow it or deliver it or, um, you know, manage it, store it, and make sure that it's fresh. We don't do any of those things. We have so many people who out, we outsource those, those tasks to. And like house maintenance. I mean, some of you are handy, I know, but like how many of us take care of our house? How many of us built our house? <laughs> That's an even smaller number. Um, it, when it comes to like entertainment, right? Uh, in a former generation, people would entertain themselves. They'd play piano or sing a song or draw a picture or just have a good conversation with a friend. And now we outsource that too. You know, we, we tell somebody to make a show for us or a movie or make some music or produce a game that for us to play. Um, it, we outsource so many things in our life. And I think we just import that idea into how we operate as Christians. Like, Oh, we know there's work to do in the church. We know that there are souls who need to hear the gospel, but then we, we, we outsource it. We say the pastor is going to do that or somebody else will do that. Or, you know, it's not really my job or it's not really my personality. Um, and, and the result is that we kind of just coast. And if you know anything about coasting, coasting is fine for a little while <laughs> until you're not coasting anymore because you've slowed down. And I think in many ways, the North American church has coasted. Um, we have, taught ourselves that we can kind of just kick the can down the road and not deal with anything or not frankly do much as individual Christians to live out our faith in this generation. And we're seeing the results. We're seeing a nation that hates God. Um, we're, we're seeing increasing persecution of the church. We're seeing a loss of not just Christian values, but just like good order in society. <laughs> um, and so what I'm asking you to consider today is that if you see a problem in the world, you see a problem in your community, you see a problem in your church, you see a problem in your family, don't wait for somebody else to fix it. Go. Jesus is calling you. Go fix it. His Holy Spirit lives within you. He will give you the words to say. He will give you the gifts you need. He will put other people in your path to help you if you need help. A part of praying for God to do his will is remembering that he's going to accomplish his will through you. And so do it. Be ready. Um, get out the door. Say what you need to say. Write what you need to write. Be there because God is calling you. Uh, last devotional point then is about Mary and Martha way at the end of the text. And um, with a minute here, I just want to drive home this idea that uh, Jesus is saying that the word of God is more important than anything. I mean, in this case, of course, he's talking about all the housework that Martha was doing, which um, certainly has some application probably to some busy, um, busy folks who have so many things on their plate, whether at home or maybe at work. Um, that they don't have time for God. But it's just so easy for us to, to put anything in front of God. Sleep or breakfast or relaxing or entertainment or friends or advancement 
or the next thing that I want to do. We're so concerned about so many things. And Jesus just says, you just need to hear the word of God. You just need to open your Bible and read it. You just need to be in church every Sunday to hear it preached to you. I'm glad you're listening to these Lent devotions. You're finding at least 10 or 15 minutes to make this a priority. Um, This is the one thing that's needful. And if you don't believe that, then go back to Jesus' death and resurrection. Like he died because people would not listen to the word of God. And he rose again so that the word of God could be preached to you and you could believe it. Um, It was so needful to Jesus that he was willing to give his life for it. And if you love Jesus, you'll love his word. It's the one thing that's needful. And so how can you make God's word priority number one in your day? Priority number one in your planning for the future. Priority number one for your children. What's that going to look like? I mean, be honest about it and, and figure it out. Write it down if you need to. Because there's one thing that's needful. And it's not everything else you're doing with your life. God be praised that you listened this long. I look forward to having another devotion with you soon.